This lesson is on the Byzantine Empire, and this is part one of a two-part series on Eastern Europe in the post-classical period. Now, when we're talking about the Byzantine Empire, in part what we're talking about is the Eastern Roman Empire, because beginning in the 330s CE, Constantinople became the capital of the Eastern Roman Empire, and the, the Romans would have known the Eastern Empire as a distinct um, political space and a, a distinct um, empire and, and referred to it as such, right? So usually we talk about 476 as being the fall of Rome and the fall of the Roman Empire. But that's kind of a Western biased idea, Western European biased idea, um, because from you know the Byzantine Empire, which you know begins in 500 and lasts till 1450 CE goes on, right? Almost for a thousand years, the Byzantine Empire rules the Eastern Roman Empire, which really bring, brings up the question, when did the Roman Empire fall? And I've listened to historians argue that the Roman Empire lasted all the way until 1450, and so, <clears throat> you know, the fall of Rome was just, you know, the fall of half the Roman Empire. And, and the Byzantines thought of themselves as the Roman Empire, used the term, um, considered themselves as such. So, Again, a lot of this has to do with point of view, right? And let's go back to Emperor Constantine. Now, we looked at him in our studies of Rome and Christianity in period two of world history, right? Because he reigned from 306 to 337 CE, which is very much a part of period two of world history, right? He's responsible for Christianizing the empire. He also founded the city of Constantinople, right? And the city is named after him. And he moved the capital to his city, which created a power base, a shifting power base within the empire, right? Anytime the official Roman Empire emperor moves, he's going to bring with him all of his bureaucrats, a lot of the upper level officials, even some of the senators came to Constantinople with him. And so this really creates two capitals to the empire and really marks the transition to two empires within, you know, what we may call Roman history. Right, so let's take a look at the strategic importance of the Eastern Empire, right? Byzantium is just the, the Latin name for the Byzantine Empire, right? And it's in a strategically very important position, right? The Persians are right here, the Arabs are down here, Egypt, right? And it really marks the, the crossroads between Europe, the Holy Land, North Africa, Persia, and off towards China and the Silk Roads, right? So this has often been called the great crossroads of the world, and I think that's an accurate term. And Constantinople's right at the center of it, right? This, this guards the, the gates between Europe and the Middle East and is still a strategically very important position. It's why the United States maintains a very close relationship with Turkey. Right? And the Byzantine Empire had more of a Greek or Hellenistic um, influence on it. Uh, the Greek language was the official language of the empire, uh, not Latin, although you know, upper, upper class members of the Byzantine Empire would have spoken Latin and Greek. Um, Greek would have been the everyday language. And they inherited a lot of the achievements from the Hellenistic period, right? You remember the whole period surrounding Alexander the Great, um, going back to the Greek city-states, so all of the STEM advancements, the philosophy and art of Hellenism was firmly at the heart of Byzantine culture and politics and interactions with the environment, right? And as I've said before, because the Byzantine Empire is the western end of the Silk Road, there's a lot of trade and wealth there, and there's also access to the eastern Mediterranean North Africa, as I mentioned a moment ago, right? So you know, the Byzantines were much more connected to the world network than Rome and uh, Western Europe. And as a result, were much more sophisticated and um, much more multicultural than the Western Europeans at this time period. So the first of the true great, you know, Eastern Roman emperor, Byzantine emperors, was Emperor Justinian, who ruled from 527 to 565. Um, and he picked up on the older Roman legal systems but made them more solid and adapt them to Byzantine purposes. He was also a voracious builder. I mean, he just palaces and temples and churches and, and really wanted to show the greatness 
of his uh, rule through building. And this kind of brings back, once again, that idea of monumental architecture. Now, I haven't talked about that um, for a long time, but remember, anytime, um, anytime a ruler builds you know, great palaces and monuments and churches, um, you know, it shows how powerful he is, but it also creates a sense of pride within the people. He also was very much into military expansionism, right? He wanted to push the Byzantine Empire west into the old Roman heartlands and really saw himself as a kind of resurgent or rebuilding Roman emperor, right? I mean, he wanted all those lands all the way to the edge of North Africa and Spain and up into Germany. He really has high eyes set on that to, you know, again, reconquer and reglorify, you know, that older empire. But, you know, it, it didn't really happen for Justinian because he faced so many threats on all sides, right? I mean, he faced the German uh, tribes to the north and west, the Bulgarians. Uh, we don't think of Bulgaria as a very tough nation now, but they were an extremely tough kingdom at the time period. He was starting to face pressures from the Arabs to the south. Now, this is before the rise of Muhammad and Islam, and so... Um, under Justinian, the emperor wouldn't, the empire wouldn't face, you know, the full power of the Arab armies. But they were still tough people, and, and a threat from the south. The Sassanid dynasty of Persia, Persia is a little bit off screen here, um, very much pushing from the east. And as I said, I mean, Constantinople is such a strategically valuable position that you know it was very hard for the Byzantines to expand the way the Romans had because their neighboring uh, peoples were just so much stronger than the Romans faced previously. Now a few things about Byzantine society and politics, right? Uh, in, for the Byzantines, the church was controlled by the state, very much the opposite of what we're going to see in Western Europe where the, the bishops and the popes crown kings. Here it's the emperor who makes patriarchs and bishops within the Eastern Orthodox Church. Um, women were also very powerful in Byzantine society. A long series of women like Theodora who had great influence on their sons and husbands. And uh, so it was a, a much more you know, female, not controlled, but female influenced empire um, in comparison to what was going on at the time period. There's also uh, a meritocracy in the government, kind of similar to China. They did have imperial examination systems, and um, you know, it was all about how smart and capable someone was rather than them being born into a noble family. And they had kind of a semi-feudal structure where you know, government officials received land in exchange for uh, service to the government, and this could be military or bureaucratic, which you know makes that which is that merit meritocracy. So kind of similar to the scholar gentries of uh, China, um, but also the kind of military aristocracy of Rome. Remember, in Rome, you know, a, a man got land by fighting. In China, very often a man got land by being educated. And so kind of an interesting mix here within the Byzantine system. Now you heard me use the term patriarch and Eastern Orthodox Church. And this is a result of the Great Schism, which happened in 1054, um, right? Uh, Orthodox Christianity became a separate branch of Christianity. And that's because the Eastern Church here was more influenced by the Greek culture and language. Um, and you also kind of, in the same way you had two emperors, you started to have two, not really popes, I mean the pope is centered here in Rome, but the patriarch of, you know, the Eastern Church um, start to um, fight over doctrinal differences like what kind of bread should be used in the communion ceremony and interpretations of, uh, you know, the Bible and other holy writings and some disputes on who Jesus really was started to split the church. And the interesting thing is, is both the Pope and the Patriarch excommunicated each other. And that just means they kicked each other out of the church. Uh, you know, and of course they take their followers with them. 
And so this creates a, a division within Christianity and you know t creates two major branches and eastern orthodox christianity is still there it is the dominant christianity of greece and had a lot of influence on the russian orthodox church which i'll talk about in the next lesson over time though the byzantine empire did decline and it was primarily pressure from turkish armies from central asia now these are the the horse people Right, like the Xiongnu and the Huns and some of those other tribes. Later on, they're going to be called the Mongols. But you know, as they push down from north of modern-day Afghanistan into northern Iraq and what is now um, eastern Turkey, they start to put pressure on the Byzantine government. Um, and, and while the Byzantines are busy with them, there start to be some breakaway kingdoms in the north and the east. People like the Bulgarians and the ancestors of the modern day Hungarians and people like that. And the Crusades had a, a big impact on the Byzantines as well. Now I've talked about the Crusades briefly in some of our lessons on Islam and I'm going to talk about them a lot in our studies of Western Europe, so stay tuned. But as these Western European knights come through Byzantine lands, they, they put a lot of pressure and damage on you know communities and agriculture. You know, and some of this is part of the the antagonisms that came out of the Great Schism. Both sides saw each other as, you know, not true Christians. Um, also at this time, the Italian city-states, places like Venice and Genoa and um, Milan are starting to become more powerful, develop their own navies and start to take over some of the trade networks in the central and eastern Mediterranean. And that puts pressure on the, the Byzantine economy. And so finally in 1453, the Ottoman Turks captured Constantinople. And so if you, you know, believe, as some historians do, that the Byzantines were the continuation of the Roman Empire, then this is absolutely the fall of the Roman Empire. So. Um, that's it. And the Ottoman Turks are going to rule this area all the way up until World War I. Um, you know, so a very long-running empire is going to take over at this time period. And so that's it. Thanks for watching.